Hello, hello everybody. Welcome to our alumni chat. I'm Jay Zabriskie, zooming from out of space at the moment. I thought it was appropriate given the subject matter of uh, our guest's thesis project. Um, I want to welcome uh, Justin Scott Lawrence. Can you see that? I see a picture. <laughs> there it is. Hey, man, how you doing? I'm good. Thank you for having me. Yeah, all the way from, I want to say, South Carolina? North Carolina at the moment. North same, Carolina. Same with my, yeah, same with my family through COVID. Nice, <laughs> nice. Stay safe, as always, man. Yeah. Um, so just by way of introduction, for those of you who do, do not know this dynamic young man, um, he was a uh, student at Los Angeles Film School, and his thesis project, Take Me to the Stars is, has won several awards. Um, and also, uh, I'll just reel off a couple, the Columbia Film Festival, Soul for Real, Los Angeles Film Awards, and the VD Space Film Festival. Did I get, get that right? Yeah. And uh, as a result, he, his film is now um, screening on Amazon Prime. So congratulations for all of that, Justin. Thank you. So we're going, to, we're going to talk a little bit about that, <clears throat> but but first, <clears throat> excuse me. What I wanted to do is I wanted to take a look at your film, let everybody see your film, and then they'll know why it's so special, and we can talk a little bit about it. Okay. Sure. All right. So uh, I'll let Marco run it, please. Just be patient.
sleepy head. Did you have a bad dream? Carl, that's your favorite drawing. Mom? Hey, buddy. Looks like someone's almost finished. There, it's finished. Carl, it's beautiful. Here, I brought you something. Here. What are these? I used to play with these with my dad when I was younger. You push the button right here, and then you talk into it, and you can hear me from all over the house. It may even reach outside. Should we give it a try? Carl, this is your captain speaking. Over. This is Carl. Are we on a rocket ship? Roger that. We have just initiated liftoff. Please enjoy the ride. Over. Where are we going? Over. To the stars. Over and. <laughs> I'm gonna miss the bus. Saturday. Where are you going? To work. He just needs time, like you do. Mom to Carl, over. This is Carl, over. Nervous. <laughs> no. This is the brightest meteor shower we've had in years. I'm excited. Yeah. Dad's not. What do you mean? Nothing. Listen, your dad says a lot of things. He also doesn't say enough sometimes. He doesn't like space. He just sees things from a different perspective than you or I. You two just don't see eye to eye yet. Start searching again. Put that away and come inside. 
I can talk to mom. What are you talking about? Through my radio. She can hear me through my radio. She's not in there. She's gone. She's dead, okay? That's what I'm doing. I'm running the show, so I have to put in the hours. Oh my god, you knew about this though. There will be other science, other science fairs. He's counting on you. I know that, but I can't take him. You can't? What do you mean you can't? You take him. Please, it would mean so much to him. I told you already, I had too many things to do around here today. He is growing up so fast, you need to spend time together. It's now or never. That boy needs to be out playing with his friends, not in his room building radios or whatever he does in there. Just give Have him you a... seen you his drawings? You need to give him a chance. He's a smart kid and he loves you. I am not taking him. Carl, grab your stuff. Let's go. Hey, hey, come on. Look, I didn't- You're losing him. Are you all right? Yeah. I just miss her so much. I know, Carl. But she can always be in your memories. I just wish I could see her one last time. Maybe I can help.
goodbye. I miss you so much. I love you, Carl. I don't want to be here anymore. Beautiful. Really, really nice, man. I, I've seen it several times and it, each time it still touches me, you know. So Good. I um, want to unpack a little bit about how you got to where you are now. This is a wonderful success that a lot of students, of course, hope for. Um, so let's start in the beginning. Um, well, almost the beginning. The themes in this movie are very um, adult. Uh, there's themes of death separation, loss of a loved one, guilt. Um, yet you, you tell it with, uh, with a child actor and so forth from the, that child's point of view. So can you talk a little bit about your inspiration for this? Yeah, um, thanks for asking this question because I get it um, quite a lot. Um, I personally did not deal with um, the death of a parent. My parents went through a divorce when I was young, uh, probably like 12. And it was very traumatic for me because my dad ended up leaving and um, left the house. And it felt to me like almost like he had died because we just didn't see him much after that. So I remember that feeling uh, of, uh, of being kind of traumatized. I didn't really know how to deal with those feelings at such a young age. Um, you know, I'm older now. I, I understand that relationships end, but I don't, you know, I didn't understand that as a kid. Um, so I think a lot of this, you know, feelings of loss that are written in Take Me to Stars, I, I wrote, but from the perspective of somebody actually passing away. Yeah, I think that makes it very, very poignant. And it, it kind of goes back to um, that you should write what you know. You know what I mean? Yeah. You, write from, for some, you write something that comes from your heart. And clearly the story comes from your heart. That's why I asked that question. And I, I think that's, you know, we, the, the theme of this conversation is how to make a thesis film that sells. 
And right. I, I don't think that was your, your initial motivation. I think you just wanted to tell a really good story. Uh, Absolutely. Um, it, it, it starts with story. Um, the, you know, and, and the one thing I can say about, you know, getting it to a point that it, it is a good story was, you know, this script went through almost 23 drafts. And I started it when we started thesis film um, pre-production, you know, or thesis film writing. And, it, you know, that, that was the nice thing about having those classes is because you had the opportunity to read it. You had the opportunity to hear it out loud several times. You had the opportunity to have people ask questions about it or, you know, if they had questions about it that didn't make sense to, to make alterations until it got to a point where you felt really comfortable with it. So, um yeah, I mean, I, I wanted to tell a good story, but uh, I mean, I'll, the first draft was not, um, <laughs> you know, it, it was a first pass. I like think if you had read the first pass, you'd be like, huh? Uh, you know, so, but by the time we got it to shooting, um, to a shootable script um, within our within our realms of what we had, I felt that it was pretty good. And we still made some modifications to it up into up until the week that we shot it. You know, there were several times where we were actually on set at that location. We shot it off location. Um, and we would hear that the actors read out some of the lines and I was going, let's omit that line. You know, that, that doesn't need to be said. We can say that with a look or let's change a couple words here and there. I mean, we didn't change the story, but there were times where we were just making it a little bit more simple because, you know, we were on set and we had time constraints and budget constraints and all that stuff. And all of those things, I think, help you know, make the film the strong film that it is. Uh, I think being able to take that adversity and turn it to your advantage is a hallmark of a, of a, of a good filmmaker. And I think that was very smart on your part. Um, you. you know, a lot of people think that, um, you know, the script was sort of an overnight, you know, sensation, came out perfectly the first time. So I was going to ask you how many drafts. So you told us 23, which is, that's a lot, you know. And, and if writing is rewriting, then you're, you know, you, you're successfully done that. But there were also some more changes, weren't there? Because there, there were a couple of scenes that are, were added after, because you realize when you cut the film together that something right. was missing. You wanna talk about that a little bit? Yeah, absolutely. So um, at, in the um, thesis aftermath, after you've shot it and you're doing your cuts, um, Obviously, I think that's when you start putting your edit together, you start realizing what I mean, already I was starting. I had a couple questions myself about, you know, the, the main characters. Um, I had a lot of questions, mostly about dad, who was Carl's dad and why he was so angry, because in the edit, he comes across very, very angry. Mm -hmm. um, very. And, and obviously, I mean, he's very guilty. He feels guilty, but it still didn't to me in the first cut, justify why he was so angry. Mm -hmm. um, even though it come acro came across good in the script and it came across good in some of the rehearsal, you know, seeing your cut, you start to realize like, oh, you know, should I have gotten a couple other things? So we actually screened the film for three or four different classes uh, at the school. Um, some of them ranged in audience size from, you know, 30 people up to like 50 people. Um, we passed out questionnaires. And on those questionnaires, a lot of the students had a lot of questions about, you know, why he was so angry. They wanted to see a couple things, or they would, they, they had a couple questions. They had questions about, there was three main questions. It was like, you know, how did mom die? We think she died and she must've died in some way, but we don't know how, number one. Number two, you know, why is dad so, so angry still? What, like, was he ever a good person even before the, you know, the car accident, you know, her death. Um, and then the other, the other question was, it's something about the wheelchair. I can't, can't recall. Um, something about the voice of it, because initially the voice of it, it wasn't the little kid's voice. It was going to be just some sort of synthetic voice. Um, and they didn't understand the connection because when I tried to explain like, oh, a lot of the wheelchairs in his head, they didn't get it. Um, so anyway, based on all that, I was like, okay, I think we need the kid's voice as the wheelchair to show the, the connection and how, like, what are we going to do to like tie up the other two questions? So we actually ended up shooting a pickup date at the observatory to show dad when he was in a happier place, um, 
I, I couldn't afford to pull the kid out of school and get another studio teacher and all that stuff. So I just made the kid, you know, in her belly, you know, so she was wearing some sort of like a prosthetic uh, piece that looked, you know, like she was pregnant. So I had all three of them together as a family when they were happy. And then of course, obviously we shot, you know, a little bit of the, the, you know, just to show that she was in a car and that's how she passed away. So we were able to answer some of the questions. And then once we added that back into some of the cuts, um, there were no more questions and there was like, you know, tears. People were very touched and moved and they weren't so confused looking after the cuts. So then I was like, okay, this is, this is the story. And, um, you yeah, know, that, that was an interesting process though, you know, going through screenings. Uh, I was forever grateful for those screenings because, you know, listening to the audience before I can finish a movie and finding out what, what it's going to take to get it to a point where the audience understands it really helped me as a filmmaker grow, but also, you know, it, it's helped the film immensely because of it. Yeah, I, I think it's great. Um, necessity is the mother of invention. And uh, I, quite frankly, having the kid there at the observatory might not have been as quite as touching as having her pregnant. Because you go back a little bit and you say, but well, they were really happy. You know, he was really looking forward to this child. So, yeah. you know, so something definitely happened to make him so, you know, so upset and ignoring this kid. What was it that was so traumatic? And then at the end, we discovered it was because his, his own sense of guilt. Right. You know? So the whole thing ties up together very, very well. And it was good that you, that you uh, did those screenings, right? Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so um, I was curious, the, one, of the, one of the issues that you had, uh, every filmmaker has, is how did you get the money together to, to, to do this? Were you independently wealthy or how did you do this? No, I'm not. Independently <laughs> wealthy. <laughs> um, I'm funded for a majority of it. So I, there are several platforms out there that you can use. Um, everybody's heard of Indiegogo. Um, the others are... Um, Kickstarter. Yeah, Kickstarter. There, there's several of them. Mm -hmm. However, somebody had told me about Seed and Spark. So it's yeah. seedandspark.com. Mm -hmm. uh, it is geared much more for, I think, creative mindset. I'm really happy that I went with them. It actually took me three or four days to get my project greenlit from them to even say, okay, we can sponsor, sponsoring you to get your money. Mm -hmm. um, they had a very structured system of, you know, we need like when you set up your your um, film or your project on there, it was very structured. Here's our wish list. Here's why. Here's exactly like almost like a line item in budgeting. Like here's what each uh, thing's going to cost. Here's what lodging costs. Here's what the permits cost. Here's what the food costs. And it breaks it down per day so that somebody who's going to give you money actually understands where the money is going for. And that person can actually say, where they want their money. I had somebody donate $200 because they were like, I want this to go towards the music scoring, mm. um, which was great, you know, and I was able to say, and it was nice because I was able to thank each person afterwards and be like, oh my gosh, thank you so much for this money because it helped feed everybody or, you know, whatever somebody wanted to um, throw money for. But so we, we ran a 30 day campaign, which was, which was kind of aggressive. But it was a lot of going on Facebook and social media, you know, every um, day almost and, and thanking every single sponsor that donated, calling them out, tagging them, um, sharing the news and the emails that um, you can generate through Seed and Spark. It gives you a database of people that, you know, even if they don't donate, who are following you. So if they don't have the money to give you right away, you know, maybe in the first two weeks, you never know, they, you know tax return comes in or something, you know, something and they, or they have a change of heart and they say, you know what, let me throw this guy a couple bucks. Mm -hmm. um, so I love the Seed and Spark campaign. I would definitely recommend anybody to go to that. Um, it was very user-friendly. Once you get your photos up, you, I put pictures of my storyboards up there so that the audience or, well, the potential audience and sponsors would understand, you know, the grasp of movie making. Like one scene is sometimes seven eight different camera setups and takes hours to get. So um, yeah, but that we, we raised about, I believe it was close to five grand. Um, and with Seed and Spark, you have to get to like, I believe it's 90% or 85% or something like that. It could, could have changed since I did it of your goal in order to, 
in order to charge everyone or to get the money from all the sponsors. But, but yeah, we, we made our goal and I, I chipped in a little bit of my own money at the end there. Um, Cause I think mm-hmm. you, know, you, ha- you have to sometimes self finance a little bit here and there, but um, yeah, we were happy. It pretty much paid for almost everything. Yeah, no, that's good. I, I you, you really, you're wonderful because I ask you one question and you answer like three other questions that I have. <laughs> that's, really, <laughs> that's really good. Cause uh, truthfully, that's part of what I wanted to unpack here um, for those students who are looking to, you know, to get their films off the ground, you know, before your film can sell, before your film can uh, win awards as yours have, you have to be able to shoot it. So let's talk a little yeah. bit about that. What kinds of things do you think went into the successful, because I think raising the 5,000 was considered success, to successful uh, raising of the money? What, what would you recommend that, uh, you know, aspiring filmmakers pay attention to when they're organizing a, this crowdfunding kind of campaign? Yeah, I, the first thing we did, um, and, I, and I partnered up, I, I had, you know, two, two people on my team, Marco Andrini and Stephanie Renaud, who were also fellow alumni, um, who kind of served as like producers for me and helped push me in that limit. Um, the one thing we all kind of talked about that we really needed firsthand was social media pages. So we set up a social media page on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter right away before we even started to crowdfund. We, you know, we put the name of the page on there, um, you know, sort of a mission statement or what the story was about, a couple of our um, uh, uh, inspiration photos, even though we didn't have photos from set yet, you know, inspiration photos, what this was going to look like, what, what it was going to feel like. We put up pictures of storyboards on there and we started an audience or, well, we started an audience, but we also started an outlet to blast that um, Seed and Spark campaign on. Mm-hmm. So I would say that's like the number one thing that worked for us was doing that. Mm-hmm. So that when the Seed and Spark campaign went live and we were in campaign mode for those 30 days, it wasn't just on our personal pages that we were blasting out. We were blasting it out on the films page on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter. Mm-hmm. And then we were sharing from each one of those outlets to our own personal pages and all of our crew was sharing it. All of our actors were sharing it. So we we're able to broaden our reach mm-hmm. on the campaign itself. I believe that about 40, no, 60%, it was about around 60% of our total campaign money was just from Facebook. Mm-hmm. And I actually used a little bit of Facebook um, ad money mm-hmm. to make sure that my post was, you know, like a scheduled post or something. Cause you, you know, we were in production for several other films at the time too, for, you know, we were working on several other thesis films in that month. So there were, there were days where I was like, I, I can't log on to Facebook today and post this. I'm, you know, I'm on set for 14 hours. So, you know, I, I spent maybe, or we spent probably, I think out of that total budget about three to $400 on Facebook ad spend so that that, post would keep getting posted without us posting it in case we forgot. No, no, you didn't take that from the seed and spark money. That, that was out of pocket, right? Correct. Yeah. But it sounds like, it seems to me like it was money well spent. It was. Yeah, it was because it was, you know, for every, every time the ad ran, Mm -hmm. whether I posted it or it was, you know, a sponsored post where we spent money to have Facebook do it, we had a contributor. You know, we would get a notification, hey, so-and-so contributed, so-and-so. So we knew it was working and it was worth it. So I think that's something to consider when you're building your budget for what your film's going to be is like, you know, how much do we need and how much of that is like, actually, it's, it's almost like in the real world of making a movie. You have to have marketing dollars, you know, to let people know you have a movie. So it's kind of like, if you think of it like that um, on a much smaller scale, you know, I think I think it makes sense to really market your campaign because that money you're spending you'll get back yeah. mm-hmm. no I, I think that's good i think you i think you said something very very uh important which is that you start to think of your film as a professional project just as any a studio picture or whatever right. where you need a marketing component because if no one knows about it how are you going to raise any money and even worse after you make the film who's going to see it because right. thinking of your audience is of course you know uh, very very important um, so what I, what I, what I thought was also interesting is you, you had, uh, what version of the script were you at this point? Were you in version 23 or version 15 when you started the, uh, the uh, campaign? Oh, somewhere in the middle. Okay. It was, it was somewhere in the middle. We knew, 
point. By that point, we through all the pre-production. Uh, in fact, with your class, with the pre-production courses, we had solidified the location. We had solidified what sort of additional permits we were going to need, mm -hmm. um, how much it was to rent the location. A lot of it was location based, and then of course any equipment that we, you know, couldn't get from the school, you know, how much that was. So we already had like a pretty good idea, um, mm -hmm. even with you know, making cuts or, you know, script, uh, uh, you know, re rewriting some of the script here and there. We knew it was there and this is what we were going to shoot. And that's probably how much it was going to cost. So, um, and if, of course, if we had anything left over from, from funds, you know, it would go towards, you know, the crew or helping pay some of the crew and stuff like that, or the cast, because they were really great. No, I, I, th I think that's important because sometimes students will um, prevent themselves from, you know, going ahead with a project because every, you know, every duck isn't lined up. And I, I don't think that that's uh, necessary. I think when, you, when you've got your project pretty much ready to go, you need to start that marketing arm so that you can begin to raise money and actually make your project happen. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, the one that I, nice thing about LA Film School is, you know, I think letting people know too, like your teachers and every, you know, spreading the word, going to some of the other classes, um, calling on for help. There's a lot of students who start the program who want to learn how to do, do these things. I had a lot of people contact me who were, you know, weren't thesis students. They were year one or year two, and they wanted to help as well. I had se several contributions from them as well. So, you know, I, I think it's important. Like if you, you have a project that you're passionate about, you know, you want to shoot it and you're going to shoot it. And you're, it's having that can do mindset and having those people behind you that go, you can do it. We can raise the funds, mm -hmm. you know, and even if we can't raise the funds, we can figure out a way to make it happen or, or rewrite the script in a way that it's shootable within, within the realms of our budget. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I don't, I, I hope nobody would ever be discouraged from saying, well, I just can't shoot it because they might have a really great story, mm -hmm. you know, Right. You just got to pull the trigger. You just got to go. Yeah, yep. absolutely. So let's talk a little bit about actors because you had uh, two uh, professional actors and then you had this young, young boy who uh, remarkably enough won uh, best actor in the, yep. uh, was it the Columbia uh, uh, Film Festival. So was this his first uh, time acting? He was a first time actor. I think the only thing he acted in before was like a, uh, it was uh, some sort of a school project. Uh, his sister actually went to LA Film School, and oh. yeah, Tatiana. Tatiana, right? Of course. Yep. <laughs> and, um, you know, I it, when I met, actually, I had met him through location scouting. Mm -hmm. He was not at all what I had thought of for the script initially. I thought of this very like, you know, Spielberg-looking kid with freckles and green eyes, or mm -hmm. and I met her brother when we were doing the location scouting. Um, and I, I was fascinated because I was like, oh, this kid is so, he was so sweet. He was so nice. He was so very charming. And he, he has this um, very mis mysterious, uh, I think, sort of air about him. So, you know, I actually did like a screen test with him right there when we were doing location scouting and had him read some of the script. And I put it on my, my iPhone and, you know, played it for several people who were on board with the crew and everybody was like, he's great. So we actually, because of him, we started um, looking for talent that could resemble his parents. Mm -hmm. uh, so it, it total, that, that's something that totally changed too. Like you just, you never know, you know, you never know what's going to happen in the, the creative process. And then, you know, the two professional actors, Vip, mm -hmm. um, who played dad was the first guy that walked into our casting session. We held a casting session, you know, at the school mm -hmm. and we had, we saw over 20, 23 or 25 guys that day. It's full day, you know, full 12 hour day of casting. And he was right. the first one that read for us. And mm -hmm. he was the only one that we truly kind of all felt passionate about. Um, and that's another thing too. I, I think, it's really important to have the people that care about your project with you in the casting process to talk about it afterwards. Because it, you know, there are a lot of decisions I think you can make as a director and a writer that are great, but you can never make a film by yourself ever. Like you have, you need input. You need input to a certain extent where it makes you, 
appreciate, you know, some of the talent that you're seeing or even appreciate what you're doing for yourself. Cause you know, um, yeah, but with VIP, it was, it was like a right away decision. And then with Mel who played mom, I worked with her on a P2, no, a P, P1 project. Mm -hmm. Yeah. She was, a, she was a actress on a P1 project and I had met her at a restaurant. She was a bartender mm -hmm. and she was like, Oh my gosh, I'm, I'm an actress. And I was like, Oh, I go to LA film school. You never know. And I never, I'll never forget her. She gave me, you know, great service, but she was also super friendly and she was a, a wonderful person. And, um, I called her and she read for a part for the P1 thing. And ever since that day, she was always on the back of my mind. I'm like, if, if I ever have a, a role that she looks the part and, you know, she's going to be my first call. And she was my first call. You know, she didn't really even have to really read for him. Mm -hmm. um, even though we did do a, a casting session just for mom, even after all of it, she was the right person for the job. And then strangely enough, when we paired all three of them together, they looked like a family. So I was like, okay, this is it. Like this is our, our cast. It was, it was too good to be true, but they were, they're all so professional and so nice. And it was one of the best experiences of my life because we all felt like a family on set. There was no drama, mm. none, you know, it was, it was great. And um, everybody was, was on board for the story. That is, that is, that is awesome. And that's very apparent. That's one thing that even though the father was a uh, brother, you know, was, uh, was very, um, angry and so forth. You never felt like they were not a family at one point. So right. that's, that was good. Uh, I was curious because he is a new actor, you know, were there any problems working with child actors? Cause I always recommend, you know, to the students, you know, coming through, I say, don't write a script with kids in it. Cause it's, you know, yeah. it's going to be expensive. You got to have a studio teacher and also you have problems with, you know, performance. So yeah. talk a little bit about that. How did you get such a good performance out of him? Well, thank you. Um, it was a little rough. It's not, it was not a, uh, you know, it wasn't, I've got a first take and that's the take and let's get one for more for good measure. So what we, we actually ended up doing was because he was a first time actor, me and my assistant director and the producers had talked about, you know, what we were going, we, we shot everything with a kid in mind because we knew he wasn't the greatest actor. We minimized a lot of his role uh, a lot of his speaking parts and we gave him a lot of activities to do throughout the whole movie mm -hmm. in the movie you'll see him eating a lot drawing mm -hmm. uh he's usually very busy doing something playing with the radio or something um he had a lot more lines before but because we wanted him so bad we were like we're going to give him activity based performance stuff and we're going to work with him on that just let him be himself for most of it so most of the acting that he did that was um, emotional or, you know, where he's really getting into, into character and, and having to give us a lot of that, um, a lot of those emotions were, were the ending scene and the fight scene with his dad on the porch. Mm -hmm. uh, both of those were very emotional, very serious. And we actually shot those first. So what we did was we got the hardest scenes out of the way first on day one. And we had scheduled it in a way that we knew we were going to have seven or eight takes, you know, probably up to 10 takes of, of, you know, each camera set up on those two scenes. Mm -hmm. And then for the, the remainder of the two days that we had the kid at the location, it was easy because it was, he had got it. He, he knew what was happening, but the hard part was over. So everything else was just fun. So we exhausted, we kind of exhausted him mentally on the first day so that he wouldn't be exhausted day two or day three. He mm -hmm. would be more like, oh, I get to eat, you know, cereal in the scene or, you know, it was more, it's more fun. And on, on day two and day three, we rarely did over two or three takes mm -hmm. because we didn't need to. Mm -hmm. um, he gave us exactly what he, he, you know, what we wanted because it was, it was an activity at that time. I was like, Oh, cool. cool. You ate your Cheerios. Great. And cut. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, no, I, I think that's, I think that's awesome. Um, because, uh, you know, he ended up, uh, and I, I'm not sure Spielberg doesn't work in the same way, by the way. Um, yeah. but he ended up doing a really, really good performance. And I think that was, that was really, uh, clever on your part to start with a more difficult thing get him up to speed and then you know but yeah. um so now you've got this terrific project and you know you've solved the problem of financing it 
you solve the problem of having a good story. Right. Um, you've dealt with the potential problems of working with a child actor. And now you've got this whole thing in the can. And I did notice that the music that you started with in the earlier cuts changed to the music that you've got now. So you want to talk a little bit about that? I thought that was interesting. Yeah, of course. Well, the music we started with in the earlier cuts were, uh, it was all um, either uh, like an inspiration track from something well known. Mm -hmm. uh, I used a lot of music from The Leftovers, which was an HBO show. Um, I have that kind of serious, dramatic, uh, otherworldly sort of undertone. Mm -hmm. so I used a lot of that. I, I, I've always been inspired a lot by music. I actually cut the film myself. So, you know, doing the cut, I tried to put tracks in that would sort of help guide me to get, to match the emotional cues. Mm -hmm. Once it was to that point that I hired, I actually hired my brother, um, who... Uh, he's my little brother. He went to Savannah College of Art and Design. He has a film degree, but he also scores music. Mm. So I hired him to, um, you know, create the maybe, music. Give you a discount, I hope. Oh yeah, a huge discount. <laughs> <laughs> but he also was emotionally he was emotionally tied to to the story. He had read the script in its earlier you know drafts. He had uh, you know and by the time it got to the final draft and he had seen a lot of everything we were doing on social media and by the time i sent him our picture lock and i said all right here's the film you know this is how long it is this is what's happening um he was like i love this so much so i i think it's important when you are getting music find find somebody even if it's not a, a family member just find somebody who was like oh i really love this and it moved me because that's what you want to hear you don't want somebody who's like half invested into it to do your music because I don't think your music will reflect it, but, mm -hmm. but yeah, I mean, I think when you're building your cut, use inspiration tracks until you find the right composer, or you could even find a composer, you know, to be with you from beginning to end. Yeah. Uh, well, the music is, the music seems really, really well done, appropriate. Um, I want to take this moment to, to say to anyone who's watching or listening, if you have any questions that you want to ask Justin, please uh, pop those into the chat and we'll try to get to those. Um, yeah, Cause I have a few more questions for Justin, but I'm happy to open the floor up and I'm, I'm looking at the chat just to see if anything comes in. Um, so, all right, so now you've got great music, good performances. And so, you know, hurdle after hurdle, you've been knocking these things down. Now, what about now you have to get people to see it. So right. um, you sort of decided the festival circuit, which is usually what shorts are for anyway, correct? So, correct. You know what? What um, did you have a strategy to attack the, uh, the the festival market? I mean, did you use uh, freeway or you know what did you do to to attack that market? Yeah, I, I sort of had a strategy. I thought, well, you know, I could submit on Film Freeway and see what happens. Um, I think. I, I used Film Freeway. I thought it was extremely helpful in deciding what areas of the country. Mm -hmm. um, I could submit the film to. So one of the other interesting things about Seed and Spark when you raise the money for your film is you can see geographically where all of those funds are coming from. Mm -hmm. So a lot of my, my uh, funding came from the D.C. area, Northern Virginia, Maryland. Um, a lot of it came from California. A lot of it came from Georgia where I'm from. So I actually started submitting film festivals in those areas because I knew that if we got selected, then I would have the excitement from those sponsors to share all of that news and, you know, increase the um, visibility at those festivals for me. They would show up, they would, uh, you know, purchase the tickets. I knew all the festival organizers would love that. So that was kind of a, a strategy behind it. Um, there's nothing more that, it just, sometimes it pains me when, when, when you've gone out of the way and you've raised raised money or you self-financed your thesis film and you don't submit it for festivals, mm -hmm. there's no way for it to really get seen by professionals unless you really, really know someone. Mm -hmm. And if you don't know someone, then the only way to submit it is you're going to be putting up a, a link on YouTube or Vimeo mm -hmm. or, you know, blasting videos to your friends. But I think, you know, going the, the festival circuit, it, it can be pricey, you know, and you have to watch out. Some of them are very gimmicky, but if you can find something within your means, 
-hmm. you know th there there are film submissions out there as low as like six dollars you know the Viddy Space Film Festival that I won uh, Best Child Actor for, where, where I secured the distribution for, was one of my lowest submission fees. I think I paid like $12 to submit for that festival. And that paid and off. On, <laughs> paid off. And yeah. on the other hand, the Beverly Hills Film Festival that, you know, they do at Grauman's Chinese Theater was $65. And I didn't even get accepted. And I was just, and you don't get that money back, you know, and it, and it hurts your self-esteem too. And it hurts, you know, it's, it's a little disgruntling because you're like, wow, I just paid all this money to submit a film. So a lot of it's hit or miss, but mm -hmm. you just have to find something within your means and hope for the best. And if you have a good story, somebody out there is going to see it. Mm -hmm. And um, so, yeah, I mean, that's, I, I definitely wanted to submit it to film festivals. I mean, there's no other way to get it shown really, mm -hmm. you know. Oh, let's see. I have a question here. Uh, Okay, how did you pick and choose which festivals to enter? So a lot of it was based geographically on right. where my sponsors were from. Mm -hmm. I didn't have any sponsors from India, you know. <laughs> so, I, so I didn't pick any, you know. And I, I also, I picked festivals that were feasibly easy for me to travel to. So in Los Angeles, if, if there were festivals in like Las Vegas, San Diego, Palm Springs, you know, even up to San Francisco, that's a quick trip. Sure. We selected. Me and me and my crew or or me and the cast could easily travel up there. Mm -hmm. However, I probably, you know, I didn't submit much to overseas European countries or England or anything like that because I'm like, that's that would be super expensive. Yeah. Um, so that's how I that's kind of how I chose. And it's it was also based on submission price, you know. Mm -hmm. All right. That's that's very good. Um, you know, I'm I'm not seeing a lot of questions, so I'm gonna ask what I sort of my last question here. But sure. I want you to go back to young Justin, um, the one who comes to um, LA Film School, okay? And I wanted to know um, what what uh, what was it that you wanted when you decided when you decided to come to LA Film School? Did you know what you wanted to do? Did you did you you didn't have this idea at this point? No. So what 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 uh, what, what did you want uh, from uh, Los Angeles Film School when you arrived? Sure. So, and thanks for asking that question. I, you know, before I was in film, I was actually in retail for like 12 years, mm -hmm. retail management, uh, which was great, but I needed a change. I, I think a lot of people go back to school because they need a change. And I was one of those people. I, um, I really didn't know what I wanted to do in the film industry. I just knew that I wanted to be a part of the process. I've always been, you know, fascinated by being on set and being in LA and, and being around other creatives it's very inspiring. So I was, I looked at LA film school and I was like, that's where I want to go. It had a great reputation. It had a great um, program. So I joined and I kind of just let the program tell me kind of what I wanted to do. I tried to get the most out of each course. I tried to always try to be a key position on every single project, whether it was, you know, a P1 project, a P2, you know, production one, production two project, whatever, so that I could really try and learn each position uh, mm -hmm. so that when it came time to graduate school or go into thesis, we were, I was well-rounded, you know, and I knew, who, and also connecting with all the other students. So yeah, I had no idea mm -hmm. that I wanted to be a director or screenwriter mm -hmm. at all. I thought, well, maybe I'll get in there and, you know, <laughs> so, you know, production design will speak to me and I want to, you know, design sets, but you know, I, I think that's the beauty to going to film school. You, it's a lot of trial and error. And, you know, there's so many different things to learn, so many different fa uh, facets to, you know, mm -hmm. filmmaking. And, it, you know, I, I, I really learned that I, I love to work with actors. I loved it. You know, in a lot of the acting classes that we had at the school, bringing in actors, I love their energy. I love being around it. I love seeing the change in direction, you know, and, and I loved writing. I love coming up with ideas and pitching them and talking to other people about it and kind of, you know, crafting it into something that can be told or shot. So, you know, that, that's the one thing the school really helped me do was realize what I wanted to do. I have, I have two questions coming. I have one, um, well, two about, about Amazon, right? One okay. was asking, did you have to make any changes to the film to get on Amazon? And uh, did you meet someone from Amazon at the festival, you know, how did that conversation? By the way, do you have a porch light on, a porch light out there? Yeah, hold on. Getting a little dark. Because, you know, we have to remind everybody, you're, you're on the East Coast, 
and we're here on the west coast so yeah hold on one sec, one sec. yeah still day it's still daytime for us uh, here Okay, is that better? Yeah, we'll, we'll find right. out. Yeah, yeah, look, yeah, you look a little bit better there. Okay. So, uh, did you need to make any changes to the film to get to uh, to, to get uh, to get on Amazon, or did they take it as it was? Yes, no, I did. Um, I, I needed. Well, yes, and okay. Well, let me let me answer the first of all. At Vidi Space Film Festival, which is the last festival that we've been to so far, we have two more coming up. Mm -hmm. But the last one that we were at was Vidi Space Film Festival. That's where I met uh, Elizabeth Saint. And she is very good friends with Nick Groff. Uh, Nick Groff is on the Travel Channel. He does like all the paranormal lockdown type shows. Mm -hmm. um, her and him are sort of like a, a duo. They, they, they started this film festival together and yada, yada, yada. But I, I had no idea who either one of them were. I just knew I was selected to, to the film festival. So... I said to myself, okay, I've got, I've got to get to this film festival because they're asking me to come. They want me to do a Q&A with the other filmmakers. So, you know, I went, I traveled to DC, um, got a hotel for a couple nights and attended this film festival, met all of them. Uh, you know, got to do another, Q, got to do Q&A with fellow filmmakers who had won in other categories. As you know, we won best performance by a child actor at that one. So I, a lot of the, the audience had questions about you know working with a child actor and a lot of filmmakers there too um elizabeth offered me the distribution deal with viddy split uh Vidi space platform now their platform is very focused on paranormal so it's a lot of like paranormal activity type stuff um alien uh you know sort of kind of that realm but they also have diversified content on there as well that's that's not just that so i thought well they must want mine on there because it's very like otherworldly ufo you know mm -hmm. um kind of paranormal you know she's dead and he kind of th you know instead of heaven she he thinks she's in a ufo or a right. spaceship so once i secured the distribution with with her and she put it up on her platform she had contacted me and said uh we think we can we know a couple people at amazon um is it okay if we reach out to them and see if they want to put your film up on their platform and i was like uh yeah mm -hmm. so you know it, it took several it actually took like a, almost a month before they got an answer back from amazon because covid was starting to affect everything yeah. and sure enough they got a response back and the only thing i needed to do was make just a couple um changes to some of the music tone there was a couple times where the decibel rating was too high mm. so i had to re-export out a uh, broadcast quality export mm. so it, it really it wasn't uh, aesthetic it was technical yeah it was technical um yeah. we we had we had clearance rights from everything else and I, i'd say that to any you know you see pepsi in there i yeah. got a letter from pepsi and saying it's okay to use you know the pepsi can in your shots mm -hmm. and I got uh, clearance from NASA because there's a lot of NASA images in there. Right. And but you did that in advance, correct? Correct. You have to do, I did all of that in pre-production before we shot it to right. make sure that we could do that. I just want to underscore that to the other filmmakers. That was done in advance. You don't Absolutely. want to take a chance and do it after you've made the movie. <laughs> Absolutely. And it's, it's very easy to do. A lot of people get scared about it. It's a yes. very, it's literally an email to, you know, you Google, find out who's in charge of it, send an email and you, I basically got an email back from each one being like, absolutely, it's clear, it's fine. You sent the script, correct? The script, yeah. Yeah, that's what I thought, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, so here's the thing. What, uh, what advice would you give to a young Justin coming, uh, coming into the school? What would you recommend uh, to, to help them na navigate the school to get the most out of the school? Oh man, I would say, t you know, take advantage of every single opportunity to be on a shoot and don't miss out on that opportunity mm -hmm. i we i look back at everything we did and i'm like you know whether it was in even like in an art class you know or or you know you have opportunities to create in almost every class but even in our, our creative art class i think it was you know we had the opportunity to shoot something so we went out and shot a couple things and you know you learn every single time you pick up a camera or you're on set mm -hmm. or, or you're editing you know you learn 
a little bit about your style and I think you learn a little bit about your work ethic and what you don't like to do, I think more than what you do like to do. Mm -hmm. So gosh, I would say, you know, go into it with like an open mindset and just attend every single, <laughs> attend every single class, be a part of every single shoot, network like crazy with the professors, network with, you know, students who might not just be the students in your class at the, at the moment, because, mm -hmm. you know, you get changed around a little bit. I remember, you know, going into like the 18th month after associates and like everybody got moved around. And I was like, ah, these are all people I never worked with, you know, but like you keep in touch with them and, and, but also be open to working with other people and, you know, build that little niche around you and, you know, start to work with the same people. If you work well with people, work with them over and over again, because those are the people that you'll never be disappointed by, you know, those people and, and, and vice versa. They will always call on you. I have students who still call me and text me and be like, Hey, I just wanted your advice on something I wrote or something I edited. Do you mind? And mm -hmm. we've been out of school now for, you know, over a year. So. Great. You know, I, I love that. Yeah. Um, I, I gotta tell you, um, I was, um, part of a webinar, um, that was done by uh, Sundance. And one of the uh, panelists said something that I, I wanted to sort of leave as a way of closing today, because uh, it ties in directly with what you said. And that is, she said that it's important for a filmmaker to find their tribe, find a group of people in movies, uh, you know, in the future. So it looks like you found your tribe with Stephanie and Tatiana and Marco and those good people. Yeah. So Gideon. I'm glad. Yeah. yeah. Gideon, of course. So uh, I, I just want to thank you. And um, uh, I don't know how we wrap this up, but, but uh, uh, it was a pleasure to talk to you, Justin. I wish you well. Oh, why don't you tell us what you're going to be working on next as a way of saying goodbye? What, what are you going to be working on next? Sure, sure. So I just executive produced a short called Su Promesa. It's your promise in Spanish, Su Promesa. And it is a short that we shot outside of school. We actually used the same kind of tribe of people that we were talking about <laughs> and, and some new ones. But we, it, it's an uh, international short that talks about the suppression of uh, women's rights in Guatemala, current day Guatemala. 30% of all marriages are arranged still in Guatemala, and a lot of them are under the age of 16. So, wow. yeah, we, we uh, you know, the a writer and director of that film was very passionate about the story. So we, we helped him tell it. Mm -hmm. and raised funds for it we shot it it's in post-production it should be coming out soon and hopefully submitted to festivals and on top of all that i've been turning take me to the stars which you just saw into a feature length film so, uh going through several rewrites right now but i have um a friend who just started a, a media company in los angeles and he's going to help help me i think get it to the next level so i just yeah that's what we're working on next <laughs> well we look forward to seeing it i know i know we're going to be hearing from you just don't forget about us when you're up there at Universal and Warner Brothers, all right? Just remember us over here. Are you kidding? Jay, without you, I don't even think we can have a good conversation. You pushed me so hard in, in my class to get Take Me to the Stars to a good level. So without you. It was great. You guys, you guys worked hard. You guys did great. You guys did thank great. So I want to thank you again, Justin. I'm just looking to see. I got some last minute questions. Nope, there's people just saying thank you. Thank and you, Anthony. Anthony. <laughs> Yes, Kandar, I see you. Thank you very much. If any of you, can I just say this too? Absolutely. If any of you want to check out the film who didn't see it all, if you go to Amazon Prime Video, you can search Take Me to the Stars or you can search my full name, which is Justin Scott Lawrence. Mm -hmm. The film will pull up for you. Um, it's also, I have links to it on my website. My website is justinscottlawrence.com. And um, feel free to reach out to me at any time. I'm, I'm more than happy to help. Yeah, well, we've got another question here. Uh, no, we did that already. They, someone asked what was the name of the sponsor, but that was Seed and Spark, right? Seed and Spark, yeah. Seedandspark.com. Seed like spark. yeah. Watering a little seed, Seed and right. Spark. Seed and Spark. I think, I think that's a good way to go for, for our filmmakers. Absolutely. Right. I, I would recommend it to anybody. It was great. Well, Justin, say hi to North Carolina. It's, right. a, great, it's a great place. Uh, I've been there. All right. I miss you, Jay. The same here, man. We'll, we'll, we'll get together when you come back here, all right? Yes. Sounds right. good. We'll hoist the beer. Right. Take care, right. man. <laughs> all right. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. <laughs>